Yeah, welcome back to High Performance Computing, our Parallelization Fundamentals Lecture 3. It is a very conceptual lecture, and you have this already noticed, perhaps, when you were looking at the first part, where we looked a little bit on domain decomposition, what that really means, that I have you know, things like a grid domain or a lattice domain decomposition that I put essentially over my input space, the application domain. It could be an ocean, it could be the weather forecast idea of having maybe a whole country simulated. Or as we have seen in the beautiful video summarizing the lecture, it's really in, in basically all the different scientific applications. You have this notion of parallelization, the domain decomposition, and of course you don't really see this necessary, but underneath uh, it's basically fueling all the computation that you see in this nice animations and then this kind of visualizations, but in the end, it's all computed data. So this, the data needs to be computed on the different parallel processing cores. And with this, you have the challenges as we were seeing with hollow regions, with ghost layers you really require, because most of them are really having this iterative nature. So they solve a problem over time in parallel which means you basically have to exchange the data. And this really motivates nicely the MPI, right? That we had the last time now, you can of understand why this MPI is needed, not to make a ping pong. That's not where we want to do and use it for. Here, the idea is much more having this different physical parameters, values from variables, actually as a message put to the other processors that, that this processor is capable of performing the next time step and the next, and the one after next. Of course, this means there's a lot what you have to do and consider in the application. So it's not that you can say, yeah, we want to simulate the ocean, I just paralyze it by four processes and throw it on the processes. That's not gonna work. You need application logic, which actually is a little bit, of course, aligned of how you do your domain decomposition. How do you position your hollow layers and so forth? On the other hand, we also want to be not stuck and say this is a processor, um, basically four that I have just available. So I have program my program here, my MPI program for four processors. That's also not what we want. So scalability is something what we also want to achieve. So it should scale up. Maybe I want to improve more details, more granularity, more physics to be computed by each processor or better by each domain. So maybe make the domain more fine grained and then apply more processes to have just much more details computed. And these details, alluding a little bit to things about scalability we will talk to now are some parallelization terms you need to know by heart if you work in this community called weak scaling, strong scaling. These are terms you really need to know and what scalability is at all. And with this, there come a couple of other terms with it, which means the speed up. So what is a speed up? So some theoretical considerations with really think about mathematical formulas that break, of course, as we just suggested again and again in the last couple of courses, already this big problem, right, into smaller ones. But what does it really mean? And why is that not straightforward? So why we don't have a linear scaling all the time? So what are there like drawbacks? And we will come to Arndahl's law and so forth. So Let's see a little bit in parallelization again in high performance computing, why that is useful. Um, we have really an ever increasing speed right now. It's unimagined because we also have now the GPU power that goes alongside the traditional CPU, right? So we can essentially say every problem we have, we can more and actually go into details and have more granularity, more accuracy. So one idea to think about is this example of a train here that is in our center where they have let's say here also interesting uh, googles to look at this but the simulation could be you know a train but then if you start with a train <clears throat> you think okay a train needs to be um, burned in order for construction and in engineering to understand how we make it perhaps more safe uh, what materials we should use to prevent the train from burning quickly how we can evacuate passengers quickly depending on which materials we take maybe for other parts of the train. These are things on a coarse grain, you just have a train, you burn that. Now it shows you also the benefit of high performance computing. We can burn these trains incredibly often, but don't have to pay for the materials. Of course, you have energy that you put from the HPC system in, no doubt, 
but it's still, let's say, more environmental friendly to burn the train virtually several times for safety purposes. But this is a coarse grain simulation if you just burn the train. What you want to do is maybe going into the train compartments. You want to understand are the really you know, fine granular simulations, meaning the material with this, the physical properties of these chairs are different. I have different materials. I can exchange them. The floor, what is the kind of substance that is covering the floor? How is the ceiling? So immediately gets a picture, which is a little bit alluded here with this program flow, that you have lots of different ways in power to compute this, but of course, different physical properties. So that all of them are just doing a blocky way of doing the same physics. In the rent, you have maybe a sort of workflow doing different parts. The interaction with heat with this material is much different than maybe the ceiling. But this shows you also that you have an you know, granularity, you essentially want to always improve because this gives you, in most of the cases, also much better accuracy, right? So the question is, is the accuracy always required for physics, for science, for engineering, or can we prove something already at a certain stage? But this shows you nicely uh, why basically we have also a need for computing uh, that goes on and go on. We could never say we're just stopped in computing. We can always simulate aspects much more in detail as we do today. Weather forecast is a very good example where we have the numerical problems in the that we can never really, let's say, perfectly know what the weather will be in one week from now because of the numerical instability inside these algorithms. This essentially alluding to another key problem we have. It's not the computing power we throw on it. It's also sometimes the methods that have to improve as well. But essentially, Moore's laws was already alluding to in this video that we have seen there's an unprecedented way of doing computing. And you see here the growing from 1970s with new form of processors, all in D, AMD processors, and also now those which include the kind of accelerators and so on. But you saw in the video here um, that I will not play again because I played it already here in the first part of the lecture. And you can always go back to the reference here to see it again. You have seen the gap right, between the normal processes, where GPU is now really being so efficient to really kind of closing this gap. However, there's still a kind of discussion in the community. What about Moore's law? Has it stopped? Has it not really stopped? Um, I mean, this depends a bit how strict maybe you want to see that, which basically the statement that Moore's law here is really the kind of grow every two years with an exponential grow, essentially then um, uh, always with a number of integrated circuits on these chips. But uh, essentially, that's not exactly also the point with it. We just see with this, for high performance computing, we have more and more computing. And now we always want to use them in parallel, right? So, but the question here comes directly to your mind. Do we then, by just having, let's say, two, three, four, five of these um, chips together, and then maybe thousands, as we have seen in the high performance computing, if that then means I can break down every parallel into different pieces. And by just deploying more and more processor power, I can be quicker and quicker. And we will realize, unfortunately, it's not the case. It's in theory, basically, is in impact as well as in practice. We see there's a kind of breakup in so-called scheduling. But before we go that way, let's think a little bit about why we want to have the parallelization. And I think it's very clear from the perspective of maybe just having one a chip available, right? So one single core, if you want, is really too slow to perform the task. The burning of the whole train will cost many, many um, hours. And then the engineers will, you know, having a long time to actually have new trains created or understand the safety ideas. Then this would be one part of it. But on the other hand, you have also the, the detail of the train as the example. You would say, you need memory for all the capabilities of this materials. They have all properties that need to be stored somewhere. The seat is different than the ceiling. So we talk about those systems are much more memory bound. So you could imagine that if you go to the med, really down, deep down detail of the train with lots of these things having specifically uh, taken care of, then a single system might be not really um, to having enough power in the memory to really have this on this required granularity or when you have to very precisely in a very fine-grained domain and composition to simulate something. So here we talk about memory problems where we basically think that the reason for parallelization is not really necessarily making it faster. That's of course inherent almost every time, but 
Here it is to el enable it at all, right? Because otherwise, signal processors would be not capable of having this kind of precision or granularity. Indirectly, of course, this also influences then what we want to achieve with our parallel application, following essentially, again, this parallelization fundamental of being an SPMD or MPMD job, um, which is, of course, uh, something to consider in this. So the real first term which comes to your mind in HPC is performance, um, is, of course, something we have seen in the top 500, so the performance in terms of floating point operations per second. You remember the laptop compared to the HPC machine. So one of the next terms you need to know in HPC is speed up, which is, of course, related to performance. So how we really measure this performance, how we measure the speed up. So we have here again our example that we had very similar like the array. We would have, let's say, this kind of um, time steps of a physical problem I have to iterate over. And you can imagine when I do this now, let's say in this time step 12, and I have just one processor available, this would take in time 12. Um, and of course, I make simple examples here to start to understand these terms. So when we now think that we have N workers um, basically working on the same problem instead of just one core, we could say they all you know, share the work and we have a domain decomposition, which is here very obvious. We probably just put all the four steps here into different parts and then let them work in parallel essentially. Of course, here the question is if it really can be done so, right? Because here you firstly think the time here is shorter. That's of course what we want to achieve. But the second question is if you don't need, let's say the time steps before to come really to the idea of 12. Of course you can do this, but then you basically have to refine maybe also the, the, the domain decomposition. So here it's really having a little bit abstract notion of a really independent way of doing computing that you do now these kind of steps, uh, of course, directly inside this. And of course you're faster, right? Um, which is basically loaded to a speed up of four here by having you know the number of uh, T basically that you have sequentially, usually by the number of processes and you add here in this example by four. But it's a really, let's say, conceptual illustration of the speed up term. Um, and it's really the first you know, exposure to you. So we will see it, this how basically there will be more advanced examples very soon. And of course, what could be also then the challenges. So one of the first challenges is this load imbalance that I already described. So from a practical perspective, it's unfortunately not like I just presented, like a theoretical idea of all those time steps. All of them will be running equal times all the times. So this is, of course, a little bit uh, something which is a very optimized way. Normally, we would have here and now and then really workers which have a little bit less to do and then have another bit less to do so that in the end, we still allocate them from the scheduler, if you remember. So all of these processes are still bound to the application. But let's say here the worker two processor is really early finished and has nothing to do. We call this unused resources and something we don't really like in high performance computing because those systems are very costly. They should be used 99%. And then of course, if we have lots of idle resources, as we also call these unused ones, idle resources, then it's not a way to do. Uh, to go. And if you have really codes which have a lot of these unused resources, you usually get also problems with administrators of the systems. They will give you a ring, they will send you an email and say you have to optimize your code. You're just using one out of four cores you're actually asking for. And when you do this continuously over time, uh, there will be definitely with someone talking to you. Also for you, of course, it would be very straightforward to change your code because usually the time on these precious resources is really rare. Uh, you just don't don't get that for free. Usually, you have time computation, time grants. You actually have to ask for, and then also let's say get grant, get granted one of these, and then basically have some time, some precious time. And when it's over, you basically want to do more research. You have to ask again. So you are having yourself a kind of idea to make a very optimized code, really avoiding load imbalance as much as you can. But we have seen in the data science example with the load on the different data items, so many to the left and just a couple of them to the right. Um, this is easier said than done. So of course here in this little application, we could imagine that maybe worker two should 
get a little bit more tasks from, you know, our worker one and the same for worker three, maybe a bit out of worker one to make a more balanced scenario if it's possible. But sometimes the domain decomposition or the application domain uh, cannot do this. So they're, of course, constrained from the application to do this. So here's a little bit um, and a very dramatic way of saying this. You remember um, our MPI ranks and how this is now related to MPI in practice. Right. So when you think about um, this load balance is really a kind of conceptual term. So how it reflects to if you have an MPI application running. And here you see one um, which has, let's say, here over 30 ranks. It doesn't matter to us how many of them are. But what we see is that our precious rank zero has so much to do, let's say, which determines also the overall runtime of this. Right here you have the time in seconds. So again, think about what we discussed uh, the, about the idea of saying that the wall time needs to be well specified. And here I have to specify the wall time of being at least 40 seconds um, as an example, because all the other ones, the other ranks essentially in your MPI application, they are already actually very fast, while rank zero is still, you know, digesting maybe all the results that came out of here. We don't know and we don't need to know. But it's, this is something which is really an issue here in the power performance strategy. Here, rank zero should be, for instance, maybe more helped by having more averages along the way from all these different processors or others. And it looks a little bit like, um, firstly, in these different ranks where you can see that the scheduler still has, of course, 32 cores here or whatever associated with your username and associated with your time. And then this kind of T38 means only then I can stop the application. Having a lot, a lot like this, looking on the physical hardware side, where you maybe use here one core, which is rank zero, and one node with it, but the all are really the other nodes with all the different cores are completely idle resources. Very bad situation and should not happen, but it happens. That's why we have performance analysis. That's why we talk about the load, decom load imbalance and why you then maybe have to come to much more smarter domain decompositions and to approximation strategies, how you cut the domain in different parts. Approximation in terms of thinking about how much data items there are, so you can approximate, okay, when I compute of all of those, I need much more computing when there's a dense structure of all of those than maybe on the, on the coarse-grained ones. One example for this and basically how it affects computing the domain decomposition is perhaps uh, when you see a little bit here, a couple of examples. And one of that is a tree code. Um, also, it nicely shows you that from the conceptual ideas, how you do parallelization, you're not bound always to the blocky scale, right? Of course, you see, again, we have a blocky character because the uh, allocation on the computer in the end is kind of blockish because a processor in the way is kind of a block here. But here we're talking about having, you know, a domain decomposition, which is more tree-like, and this is particle interactions. So basically, you would say that those particles that you have around here, which are close to me, I would really have them detailed. So I will compute with every one of them the interactions of my force field, which influence then my position perhaps on the next time step. And then the next, I always have to interact with all the particles, right? They also influence my position. I influence their position as, you know, me here as a particle. So, but you have short interactions and long interactions. You could say that those which are, let's say, a bit more distance could act actually as one, let's say, larger block together. I don't need to compute all four of this. I kind of okay if I have here the long range interaction, perhaps not so precisely computed. And the same is true here. This, of course, saves you a little bit in terms of computing, but also the domain decomposition in this regard, of course, will look different. And of course, when you think about now why that is important, you have to think about that we have this high performance computers, which doing all of these computation, this floating point operations um, that we allude here to in, in per second. And this is this kind of flop that we already had in one of the earlier lectures, which relates it again to high performance. So I use many of these interactions to actually do this at the same second. And this is, of course, something where then supercomputing it plays a big role. You have lots of those and cannot have a couple of particles that you maybe have seen here, uh, then in detail computed using specific simulation packages like nBody will come later on in subsequent lectures. 
But then, of course, you have lots of different particles that are all moving. So which means their movement is the important part here, right? Um, in moving, I want to know the next time step, the next time step, I have a certain particle velocity uh, that is going on here. And I want to know the position of the particle in the next time. So these are extremely interesting uh, ideas of, you know, where the challenges are now in terms of your domain. It relates something to the application domain. I have particles here, for instance, in terms of just maybe the wave propagation or an ocean. So there are different factors in this. And when we really want to understand what are these kind of factors um, and why we want to basically being more fast and faster, we think about so-called factors that influence the scalability. This domain decomposition is really one factor of them, but not the only factor of them. We can see that the architecture itself has a big word to play inside basically what you can do. We see here an older machine, Blue Gene Q, um, which is, let's say, uh, an older system from EBM, but it doesn't matter. Here the challenge is you want to use the whole system, which means you have a code uh, that we have seen, this tree code with particular interaction that could just scale to the whole system. So we're not actually anymore having a problem of you know using more computing and being more realistic or having much more particles. In a way, we can do this. However, we also want to understand what happens if it's really faster and if it's completely scalable, meaning now when I move to jewels, which has orders of magnitudes of coping, would be this code just going on and going on with the performance or does it break up with the performance? Will it be not as fast if I do the double amount of processes? Will it be remaining to be fast or will there be a slowdown? And this is something that we basically for, for us here really have to understand when we have in HPC codes, what means faster? Do we really have, is a scalable application? Can we put more, let's say, details to it, like in the train example, or do we just simply want to have it faster computed by having the basically the same train with the same problem space constant, but just throwing more cores to the problem? And this brings us to the idea really of so-called scalability metrics. And these days you almost find no pages or no, no basically papers no descriptions of codes where there's not a strong scaling and a weak scaling uh, plot. And this is now for some students in my lessons learned a bit hard to understand because in the end you think you have just processes. They are in a way equal. And of course they are equal from a certain perspective, right? They're just chips. So you would imagine that these are doing the same thing. And of course they do in a way when they have the same times of computing but you have to imagine the broadest picture in this. So here we're really talking about having lots of lots of these cores working together with an application. So by working together, you have of course lots of synergies with a parallelization benefit. You can do much more together, but you realize that of course you have also some, let's say constraints which come with it, which means you have interaction. You actually have to transfer maybe some data every now and then to the other cores. You have basically some initialization or you have different aspects which really can hamper your performance, including I.O. You maybe here and there want to dump things to disk because you don't want to recompute uh, recomp maybe a weather forecast that you have already running since 12 hours on a very large high number of cores. It would be, let's say, wasted resources if it, you know, is not really dumped to disk. So, and IO can be also someone that a bit hampers the parallel efficiency. Hence, if you think about always increasing just cores, you, of course, immediately in your brain think it would be linear scaling. So it would be just going on and beautiful, more higher and higher. But the realistic parts of it is, as you see here, when we have, for instance, just an MPI one um, implementation, it is actually having a tail off as we speak. So we're not any more linear, we're close to linear in the beginning and we're going more and more away from it. So this also motivates them with the, let's say, message exchanges drawbacks that you would have by having more and more cores involved in all of these communications. There needs to be more communication overhead. In a way, it's, it's of course clear. And people have started to tackle this with hybrid 
codes. Hybrid means they also would include shared memory with it, right? So you would have MPI combined with OpenMP, something what we will have in one of our lectures. But that's not the point here. You still see that even by having, let's say, cutting edge technology, cutting edge software frameworks, we, the realistic part is that there will be uh, something which tails off in the weak scaling, in the strong scaling plots. Now, coming back to those, um, this is basically different type of scaling when you basically consider them. Um, the strong scaling is from my expertise in the last years from the students the best intuitive to understand. So here's really what brings us a parallelization, right? So this is strong scaling. I say I have a train, it has the same detail, and I just want to increase the number of processes. So what is essentially coming out of this? And then I in increase just the number of cores, right? In order to show the speed up, and depending on the number of cores, of course. And this is what you can do, right? You keep the problem constant. The other way um, is basically then weak scaling where basically this asks a different question to the application really it says what is possible to do with this application so when we say the particles we can have a simulation of particle interactions maybe in the order of thousands or in the order of millions and the order of millions means we need maybe much more memory but it also means that we ad advance the problem itself basically from thousand to a million of particles so in a way, we don't have the constant train. We now add the train and all the seating area with different materials. We add in the seating areas also the ceiling and also the roof and also the properties we have there in physics. We basically have the floor, the different materials, maybe for different aspects. So you see more and more detail. The problem size is heavily increased, um, basically. And we will see, can we do this when we have, let's say, also the rate of processes, of course, along the way, or will it be, again, a problem? And in a way, of course, what we want with this essentially is much more showing that we want to go to much bolder simulations, better simulations, more detail, more granularity. But a weak scaling plot can give you a little bit of realization uh, hints if, you know, this will continue to go on if you scale up to more and more processes. So maybe there are limits and we will discuss them again when we come to some details and some aspects of it. In a way, you can put this into some certain formulas, um, these two things. And, and it's very clear that this is, of course, a little bit conceptual lecture. Once you have really, um, let's say, really HPC codes, you come to a much more obvious way of doing it. Here, it's basically defining a little bit what we mean by strong scaling, where we really have to think about this fixed problem size. So this is something which you can keep into mind when it's strong scaling. You keep the problem um, fixed, right? That this is F4. However, you have also the other part where you say we would imagine you have just a single processor doing all the work. We call that the serial runtime on this fixed problem. So this means we have a serial part of this application, maybe, and a parallel part. But as we have a serial runtime, that doesn't matter here so much. But we also say, like, maybe, and this brings us to the next part here. So maybe there's one part of the application that is basically just serial, but there is a parallelizable part in it. So this is already good news. So we could end up of thinking about the, like this fellow and using more of N parallel workers. And the trouble is you can never parallelize really the serial part here, right? Things which be, happen before maybe MPI init and after MPI finalize. Things like initialization. There are lots of different things which cannot be really parallelized when you have a practical situation. So this is something where still you can apply more and more basically processes if you have n parallel workers and more and more cores available. And basically this would be in the strong scaling here. So, and you have to show that then, of course, when you increase the number of processors, that basically then your time for a fixed size problem uh, will be then also reduced. Or if the serial part is so much, let's say, controlling it, and we basically will come back to a, to a way. So here we want to really minimize the problem or the time to solution for a given problem that always stays fixed. I brought you some example because usually that's much better to understand, right? Here we're thinking about um, essentially this kind of particles that we have seen, the number of cores we advance here. We see the ideal scaling with linear 
And we have here, let's say, a kind of different ideas of how many particles I use inside these different plots, right? But of course, here I keep the, those constant by increasing the number of cores, right? So basically each of the different plots uh, inherently sh shows you exactly how many particles there are. And essentially you see again, again, the tail off, right? Because there could be overheads in the different ways. And um, unfortunately, it could be related to many other things, how many computing will be in the, let's say, inhomogeneous particle distribution from the domain decomposition and many others. However, you have to see this goal, uh, the, the code already scales to, let's say, 1000 processors here, um, depending on the application problem size that you still keep fixed. But of course, to have this plot, let's say, shown in the most efficient manner, you add those and add more and more particles and basically have the cores right. So, but you don't change them over time. And with this, you're able to have the relatively speed up, of course, computed. And this is, of course, with different kind of plots here and different um, aspects. But it really is a problem size that stays fixed by just having more and more processes. And that's what you really have to understand by heart to know the difference between weak scaling. This is often also an exam question, so please, really learn these things to your heart. What will change when I have a weak scaling idea? And this is of course something which we can put in a formula, but also which in practice is not always perhaps perfectly uh, to be measured. Um, this is here something where we have the serializable part that we already know, but for a V problem, which means here variable, so the, the problem size actually doesn't stay constant over time. So basically we have here the parallelizable part and then the number of processes, but each come with a so-called alpha here, which says um, maybe there's not something which can be nicely parallelized anymore. So you basically have a hamper in the, let's say, performance that you have here. And if you do this now in the parallel runtime, um, you end up with this interesting formula um, where weak scaling really means um, we have to do something which, again, you know, increases um, essentially in the amount of computing um, we often see then the tail off in this weak scaling where this could be communication problems because essentially you add more and more processors and problem sizes that then of course increase significantly the runtime and then suddenly you really, that's why it's sometimes really dramatic tail offs if you just have let's say the next thousand processors to it because essentially you really have done to a point that you cannot do this anymore better. Um, this is related also with weak scaling in a way um, when you think about this Gustafsson's law. Um, and this was the idea of um, why we do high performance computing, right? So uh, we have always this assumption that the parallel part is proportional to our problem size. So basically the idea is that if you have bigger problems, they just scale better um, because then more and more the zero part is not so important anymore. And this is of course something why we need to parallelize. When I have a laptop that is, let's say, computing something in 10 minutes, and then I want to use high performance computing for it to really have the overall overhead of using, let's say, 200 cores for it to be lower than 10 seconds or 10 minutes. The question is, what are the zero parts which really hinder us of really going there and, and having a significantly speed up? So essentially saying, if you have a really big problem, then that's what you want to do. You go to high performance computing and um, then basically you see that all of these serial parts um, more and more are not so important anymore. If you have a 24 hour um, you know, simulation for the weather, uh, but still a serial part somehow of getting the data in, then it doesn't matter so much if you simulate you know, for 24 hours. If you simulate just for three minutes, but the data IO maybe take you also three minutes, then it's a complete different sort of a question. So um, if you really need to go that far. So uh, again, you have here the example perhaps, um, which you see with parallel efficiency. Another term you need to know when you think about the runtime that is coming. So essentially saying it's uh, basically, of course you want to have the efficiency to not really break off, um, which you see essentially here by this big scaling that the number of cores, um, they're getting of course much higher Right, and you then still also have essentially here the particles per core, 
right? And this is now an important notion. Remember what I said in strength scaling, the fixed total problem size was really fixed. Now, what we do here in weak scaling is how the time to solution varies with the number of processes for a fixed problem size per processor, right? So essentially, the more cores we add, we also add more particles because we have 1,000 particles per core. So I have a variable process or application size of a very, very kind of variable problem size, really, because the steps here is not only just adding cores, it also adding significant complexity in computing the particles with each core, of course, that I add. So here you see dramatically increase of computing requirements, so to speak. That's why it's tails off. At some point in time, it is just basically also to think that while having more and more particles that I add here, right, with each of the different cores, and then scaling really high up, you have to have lots of these different interactions. You see here, it's like almost 500,000 cores. And each of these cores would have 1,000 particles. These particles interact with each other, uh, basically according to known physical laws. So this needs to be all computed. This is not a problem in the beginning, although you see already um, kind of a small fall. But the more you add in terms of this kind of um, complexity, you will immediately see the tail off. And with this also then the, the parallel efficiency that basically there. So this is kind of the idea that is behind this. And of course, which drives us in parallel computing because we want to have in a way more realistic simulations. We want to go to different abstractions to lower scales to really have more fine granular simulations. But on the other hand, we see also when I do more fine granular, adding more and more particles per core, then essentially the tail off is, is really tough here. And this also means the efficiency, right? So here we basically are going to lower efficiency and the runtime is essentially going higher and higher. That's what we expect because it's more complex, but the efficiency is also going down because essentially maybe some have to wait some more more processes for the others to finish this computing. Um, this depends, of course, on your load balance again. Now, understanding this a little bit, that we want to increase always this kind of parallelization, but of course, when we do so, we not only stick to it of just performing a nice speeder. In some ways, we also want to increase in the problem size that goes with it. And this brings us to this weak scaling and to the idea of Gustafsson's law. And um, essentially, they are a little bit in relation to each other. If you think about that, what we discuss now with Amdahl's law, because what we see is, of course, given I.O. bound applications or things that really are perhaps partly not serializable, you have here the problem that no matter, and this is what Amdahl's laws essentially is about, is it says, however, you basically um, have this kind of, you know, end to the infinity using more and more and more processor power, the problem is that essentially the, the parallel program is always limited by its serial parts. And this is, of course, essentially what you can understand. Yeah? It's a domination of its serial parts by using more and more of these processors. But um, of course, this Gustafsson's law we just have actually th thought about is also thinking about, well, um, if you have this problem, then you think about larger problems. So if it's really the serial part that makes up your parallel application, then you're in trouble. So in the way, you should not go there. But there's big debates about Amdahl's law in the realm of data sciences, which we will come back to in subsequent lectures. I just wanted to give you here one example that, of course, um, when you think about this, that the strong scaling and weak scaling are kind of two terms, but uh, let's say they're same, the same application, right? You would do a strong scaling and the weak scaling. You're just adjusting the problem sizes with the cores. And in this sense, they're still, of course, a little bit related. And this loaded term of serial part is really something we have to think about. Uh, this communication overheads, this IO, more in subsequent lectures where we will come back and come back to these notions. And also, particularly in lecture eight, we will talk about this. You can imagine now it's some complexity. Um, it's not only any more of thinking about should I increase the problem size? What is so my memory usage? Should I increase the number of cores? It's also how you interact with them. So you have MPI message exchanges that you learned in the last practical lecture. Do I do a broadcast at the right time or do I do a gather and suddenly I wait for one processor all the time creating load imbalance? 
So these are different questions where we will come back to in lecture eight to really analyze your HPC application in a systematic manner by so-called tracing technology. We trace the application, the parallel application, um, and then know a little bit more about it, like all the MPI applications, uh, basically the functions that you executed, how much time they took, the communication patterns. We understand what is what type of performance problem is there and where is it actually in your HPC application and then put it also alongside the HPC architecture where is this in the system it is maybe related to let's say a problem of an IO node that maybe is you know not cannot hold all the load to put something to IO and the different tools there's the Scalasca tool set there's Vampire we'll all learn this in lecture eight and it's directly related to the performance to the speed up we just learned today and you can imagine that people with having high number of cores use, they really require those tools. You cannot, I would say, um, I state this here, do that manually anymore. If you have, let's say, thousands of thousand cores, you lose the control. Usually to understand what's really happening, you need this kind of tools to really then improve the performance, to understand load imbalance, to understand bad programming, maybe in communication, uh, things like that we will also look in lecture eight. And this is all basically for the parallelization from a very conceptual part of view. Um, we have seen some formulas which are by heart, maybe good to know, but strong scaling, weak scaling, these are things to really know much more in practical terms. And you will see that in subsequent lectures, specifically also about the applications, we will have those such plots to really understand their behavior. However, for now, take away the message that again, parallelization is everywhere in these applications especially in engineering and in science. We had a little bit of science in the first video, so I thought maybe it would be good to have an engineering one, also basically part here uh, in this particular video. And we have stopped with this video. And after this, coming back to lecture four, then next time. So let's have the video.
Okay, this was a very interesting video, I hope for you, that also manufacturing, material sciences, this is really things where HPC is also used a lot, and we will come back to this also when we think about computation, fluid dynamics, finite elemente. So this is a really broad spectrum of applications which we see there, which is also often aligned with industrial use cases these days. And I think I stop here, and we will come back to lecture four then in the next course hours.